and we are back. Hello, good afternoon. Um, welcome back to Lockdown Learning after our little hiatus, um, for the live streams at least. Uh, so, yes, welcome back. It's June, it's sunny, at least here in Newcastle anyway. Um, and we've had a break. Um, well, I've had a break. And some of you will have had a break as well, I'm sure. Um, and um, we're ready to go again. Uh, so um, let's begin with some housekeeping and then we'll we'll get stuck in. So from a housekeeping point of view, um, obviously we've just had a week's break in kind of live streaming world, in real time world. And... Um, now that we're we're coming back and and thoughts at least in the UK anyway are starting to turn towards people going back to work, however foolhardy that may be, uh, I am a, in a situation now where I'm having to plan my unit going back to work and uh, and all of that sort of thing. So um, I'm not going to be doing five days a week as I was before. I'm not going to be doing every work day because it's just going to be too much of a drain on my time. So what we're going to do for now is go to three, a three-day-a-week schedule for lockdown learning. So for those, um, for those live streamers, it will be Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. For people who are not live streaming, there'll be three new videos a week, um, but not five a week anymore. And hopefully that's a good balance between keeping things rolling along and keeping uh, their new fresh content on, on, on a on a pretty regular basis, but not um, completely inundating everybody's time uh, as people start to think about returning to labs and things like that as well. Because it's not just obviously it's not just me that's planning going back. I'm sure there's a lot of you as well who are who are planning on your your returns to work. So um, that's kind of the the schedule for the next few weeks. And the other thing that we need to think about a little bit is content uh, and what we're going to be talking about. So um, what we did in the first nine weeks was to use, um, we used RNA-seq as a, as a peg to hang our hat on, basically. So the idea was that using the framework of this RNA-seq experiment that we were going to analyse, we wanted to introduce a whole raft of uh, sort of core technologies. So... Um, we talked about uh, Linux. Um, we introduced command line Linux. We and virtual machines themselves as well. Um, we talked about command line Linux and a lot of the a lot of introductory material to the kind of tools that were available to us in command line Linux. Um, and then using those tools specifically to address some of the questions that arise in RNA seq. So. Uh, questions about quality control and about quantification. So we use fast QC and multi QC to do some, some quality control of, of, of some data that we downloaded using SRA tools. Um, and then we use salmon to quantify that data. And after we'd done that, we moved into R. So we spent then spent a few weeks uh, introducing uh, the fundamentals of using R and R studio and we then looked at using those tools in, in that statistical programming language for analyzing our RNA sequencing counts that we generated using Salmon. Um, so we got to a point uh, before just before the break where we had done that analysis for two different experiments, both related, both part of the same gene expression omnibus entry. Uh, and we had even spent um, our final uh, session before the break, so number 42, uh, which we had spent uh, comparing those two analyses, at least superficially. Um, and uh, hopefully what, and I know from uh, from correspondence that I've had and from some chatter on Slack that there are people who are now using those, um, those uh, skills and those technologies that we learnt in those first nine weeks to begin to analyze some data that's directly relevant to their own research. And that to me is the, is the acid test of this. Can you take those lessons that you've learned and apply them 
uh, to your to your own research or to data that's relevant to your own research and it's really gratifying to see that people are are trying to do that and again I would encourage people if they are taking those first steps to analyzing uh, data independently to really make use of that slack channel and make use of um, uh, the contacts uh, that are available via that or by contacting me um, and I'm quite happy to help people as much as I can, at least as much as is viable within the confines of everything else, uh, to really get going with their own data. And it's as I said, it's it's really uh, encouraging for me to see people taking those steps with with data that we haven't sat here and analysed together. Um, and so I've had a long a, a think over the last ten days about about what we're going to do next. Um, and there's lots and lots of options, lots of different things we could do, and lots of things that have um, that have been requested by various people. Um, and I think was kind of what I've settled on is that we should begin at least by looking at short read alignment. So uh, the process of um, aligning reads to the reference genome to a reference genome. Um, and the reason that I thought that was a good place to kind of come back in um, is because that's the f that's that's a f the first stage process for an awful lot of other things that we could do later for a lot of uh, uh, of um, uh, for want of a better word bioinformatics workflows that we could undertake next so short read alignment is required as a first step for an awful lot of, of of bioinformatics so wherever we want to go next short read alignment seems like a sensible first step so that's where we're going to begin today and that's what we're going to talk about today um, and so in order to do this uh, we need some data so uh, if we're going to begin a, a kind of new little um a new little work package essentially a new a new kind of case study then let's begin it with some data and with some tools that hopefully are familiar to us so uh, where we're going to begin um, is with our perhaps you might think slightly neglected and slightly forgotten virtual machine um, so um, um, let me switch this off slick as always there we go so um, Right, so VirtualBox, if we uh, remember way back when, we've not used our virtual machine for a while, but it's been kicking around all the time. Um, we're going to get back into our virtual machine and then we are going to uh, start some data downloading so that when I've done my introduction, um, which admittedly today might take an awful lot of the hour um we've got some data so but even if it, even if we get round to actually doing stuff with this data tomorrow at least we've got some data there ready to go so um i'm going to start my virtual machine up what i i'm just going to mention while i'm on this virtual box screen you will see that i have I do now have two virtual machines kicking around. So I've got my lockdown learning virtual machine, which is the top one on the list, which is which I made uh, is the virtual machine that we used for all of our work in the in the first sort of four or five weeks. Um, but I've also got a second virtual machine here, which at the moment is called Lockdown Two. The reason for that is um, there was a lot of questions. Um, from users who were following the lessons a few weeks behind um, uh, when we started downloading data so which actually we did fairly early on so wget uh, was a was a relatively early um, lesson but people who were coming to that a few weeks behind the live sessions were really struggling to get data downloaded from even from uniprot which should be relatively straightforward because it's a straightforward um, uh, API for downloading that data and the problem was that I discovered it took an awfully long time for me to, to discover this uh, the problem was that in the new version of Ubuntu or Zubuntu as we're using on this course um, uh, which is called Zubuntu uh, 2004 which was released in April um, 
the uh, good folks at Canonical updated a lot of the security settings and really locked a lot of things down. And one of the side effects of that has been that um, the security that's required to use HTTPS, while it works, still works in the browser, it was failing at the command line. So it was failing with both wget and with curl, which is an alternative protocol for downloading data at the command line. Uh, and there were some people who were who were really um, were coming up to that relatively early lesson to try and download data, and it, uh, uh, and it wasn't working, and that uh, and it took me ages and ages to pin down what was going on, and it was because um, when people were coming to it a few weeks after the default version of Zubuntu that was offered for download was 2004, so they were downloading the default version on on the Zubuntu website, which is exactly what I did on in the early lessons, and they were getting this new this different version, and that was causing these problems with downloading data. So in order to try it to uh, finally troubleshoot that, I had to install 2004 myself, which is why I've got now got two virtual machines kicking around. Um, as a result of that, and as a result of various other things that have updated recently, so particularly R has been upgraded to version 4.0, and actually is about to, this coming weekend, be updated to version 4.0.1. Um, I am going to do a, a future lesson on on upgrading all of these things, get, getting our current versions of things which are now slightly out of date up to the to the most recent version uh, but i didn't that wasn't a particularly a particularly kind of um uh, exhilarating lesson to start back with so hence why i'm talking about uh, um realignment today and we'll do that kind of ha that sort of um technology lesson later on uh yes that's a good comment actually so so the comment there saying um 1804 will be supported for some years. Yes, so the uh, version 1804, which is the version that we're using, that we that those of us that began at the beginning, uh, sorry, that are, sorry, are following on live, um, those of us that downloaded back in March, who downloaded 1804, uh, it's what's called an LTS release, so it's a long-term support release, uh, and Ubuntu's LTS releases are supported with security updates for five years so it's not going away anytime soon um so um um we don't have to upgrade it but just for compatibility reasons it's good to, you know as as the the issue showed with um with people having problems downloading using 2004 um it was something which is something where if i'm using a different version or we're all using slightly different versions, we're going to have compatibility issues. Uh, I did actually nail down that issue with downloading data. There is a solution on the comments on the relevant video um, on YouTube uh, for those of you who might be interested in the in the answers to that. Um, right, okay, so I'm starting my VM. I'm starting my 1804 VM, so I'm starting my the, the old VM that we used for everything to begin with. Um, so my virtual machine is starting up and because it's been it's basically been been lying dormant it's been switched off in the intervening period so there should be nothing different about the setup of this vm when it starts nothing should have changed between when we were working with it um five or six weeks ago and today so here is my vm started up and I'm going to start my terminal, which is where we spend most of our life in our VM. So I'm going to start my terminal emulator. And again, you will see that nothing about this has really changed, which is good. A nice, old, comforting environment from where we were before. Um, and as well as my um, command prompt coming up, you will remember, I hope, uh, that we when we installed Conda, uh, we now have a Conda environment which starts up with our um, with our uh, terminal. So I'm in my base my base Conda environment here. Um, we're going to download some data, and so in order to download that data, um, we certainly want uh, the SRA toolkit to be able to to download. Uh, Download the data that that, um, that we need for for doing our alignments later on. Uh, we're also going to download a reference genome as well. Um, so, 
for that and for in, and also for the tools that we're going to use when we come to do the alignment, we want a condo environment. So we want to establish a a new uh, condo environment for that work. So um, I'm going to have to uh, remember my condo commands. This is one the bit one bit of the lesson I didn't prepare for. Um, so it's uh, condo and then. Uh, tab should give me some options. It doesn't seem to want to. Okay. Um, let's. Okay. Let's try something else. Let's have a look at our history because we've created. We've done this before. So let's look at our history and let's search our history for all of the conda commands that we've that we've run in the past. And there we go. There's a there's a conda uh, command which creates an environment. I'm not a Conda, exactly a Conda super user. So there we go, uh, Conda create, uh, and then the name of the environment with the dash N option. So uh, let's create a new environment. So Conda create, and we're gonna call it, uh, the name that we give it is gonna be alignment. Okay, so that's gonna be our new Conda environment. Uh, I'm not gonna store, install anything into it uh, immediately. I'm just gonna start it up and get it uh, get it created. Um, so Conda's now going to create that environment for me, uh, and then the first thing that I'm going to, uh, the first thing that I am going to install into it once it's been created, is the SRA toolkit so that we can download some data. Um, and I'll just quickly show you the data that we're going to download um, once my Conda environment is up and running. So yes, I want to continue. There we go. Good. Um, so that's created the environment, and then it tells us to activate this environment. Type conda activate alignment. So that's the next uh, step: is to activate that environment. So there you go. We've activated our our new conda environment, which we've called alignment. We'll install some software into here. The first thing I'm going to do is install uh, its SRA. I think it's SRA hyphen toolkit. Let's let's try that and check. Um, off we go. It should, if it, if I've got the name right, then it should find it. Um, otherwise, it's going to uh, try and track it down. I don't quite know what's going on at the moment. Um, Honda seems to be struggling slightly, but that's okay. I'll give it a couple of minutes while we're thinking, and then oh, it's not SRA toolkit. Okay, let's uh, let's just kill that. I'm going to press Control C because it's not SRA toolkit. Uh, so I've just pressed Control C to kill that command. It's SRA tools, not SRA toolkit. Um, come on. There we go. Press Control C a few times, and eventually it comes back to me. SRA Tools is actually the right thing to install. Um, so hopefully this won't take forever. Uh, SRA Tools is already installed, so it should just import it into the existing environment. It seems to want to install a few other things, um, perhaps to get my environment sorted. Anyway, let's install what it asks us to. So off we go. Um, so this is just, just going to get my environment set up so that I've got the SRA toolkit so that we can download the data. I'm just going to download one sample just by way of example today. So we're going to use prefetch um, in the way that we did with our RNA-seq samples. We're going to use prefetch and then we're going to use fastq dump to chain to turn it into fastq. So um, First things first, let's have a look at the data that we're going to download. So um, I've not given this a, a huge and overwhelming amount of thought. Um, I just wanted a, a relatively simple uh, and straightforward example. So I'm going to download some genome sequencing data um, of a, a very, very well understood uh, microorganism. So we're going to uh, download some genome sequencing data from E. coli. So somebody has produced a genome library from E. coli and have sequenced it on a MySeq. Uh, and as I said, I've not 
given a, a massive amount of thought to uh, the sample that I'm going to download here. I've just searched the SRA for some Illumina E. coli libraries, and this is one of the early ones that I've come across. Um, so um, uh, this is just a, a something that I've just grabbed from the SRA. Uh, the important thing is the run ID here. So uh, SRR one one eight six six seven three six is the run ID um, that I want to uh, is the is the 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 run ID of the of the um, experiment that I want to download. So we're going to use prefetch to download that accession. Um, so now that we've installed SRA tools, uh, we should have the prefetch binary ready to go. So we do. There's prefetch. We can check how it works with dash dash help if we want to, and that will print out the the help file for prefetch. Um, the simplest way to use it is just to give it a list of accessions. Uh, and we just want this one accession. So we're going to run prefetch. Uh, hold on, before I do that, <laughs> let's get ourselves in the right place. So I'm not, uh, it's been a while since we've done this, so and it, it's showing. Um, so um, as before, we it's, it's a reasonable idea to download uh, the data, the thing, the data that we're downloading, it's a reasonable idea to put that in our share directory, um, which is where we were putting things before. Remember the directory that is shared with our host operating system. So let's CD into the right place before we start downloading anything. Um, so here we go. This is our share directory. Uh, in here we have all of the work that we've done over the last nine weeks, um, including the R projects, which I was working on on my host machine. Uh, but all of that data is still in this share directory and is still available to my virtual machine. Um, all of the code, by the way, for that we worked on um, up to the break, uh, that code is all committed on committed on GitHub. And Git and GitHub will also be a topic of a future um, session if anyone's dying to know how Git and GitHub work. Um, so let's make a new directory for this work. So let's make a directory called uh, week 10 and let's CD into that new directory. Uh, so our present working directory is home Simon share week 10 and that's where we're going to put this data. So then the data is then downloaded with prefetch and I know it's not on my screen anymore but the accession that we want to download is SRR uh, one one eight six six seven three six okay so that is the accession number that we want to download so this is as i said earlier a a um a myseq um uh a myseq run of uh an e coli genome library so somebody's built a gene a library from from genomic dna from e coli and then sequenced it on a myseq so uh, there we go we'll run prefetch and that should go off and download that data and should put it into my present working directory so if we if we open a new uh terminal sorry new tab same same deal but in the same window um and we have a look with ls we should see that a, a directory with the name of that um uh the name that is that accession has been created and so dan's asking a question about the fact that when he starts his terminal he doesn't get his conda environment um this is something which he's asked about on slack and bamboozles me slightly i'm not gonna be able to debug it live right now the only thing i will say is that you should try executing your uh your conda.sh file which is in uh in the home directory uh in you should have a directory called mini conda 3 or maybe anaconda 3 and in there uh, i think it's in etc profile d then there should be a a file which is conda sh this is the this is the script which is run when conda starts so if you source that script 
that should start Conda and you should be dropped into your base environment. If that doesn't work, then I really am stumped. That's my only contribution that I can give you right here, right now. Um, but I will now move on. So that is downloading our um, that's downloading downloading our data as an SRA file. And in fact, it looks like it has now downloaded. Um, so SRR. Uh, so that's downloaded the SRA file. Um, then to convert that to FastQ, we use FastQ dump. Uh, and again, I can use dash dash help to give me the help. Um, okay, so uh, let's have a look. We want uh, we want to point it at the file. We want to. Um, I'm trying to remember how we did this before. Let's let's have a look at our script, shall we? Because uh, that's going to be helpful. So um, our script for doing this before was in week number. Hmm, let's have a look at week five. Nope, not in week five. So maybe week four. Yes, there you go. Get SRA. Uh, get. SRA robust. There we are. Fast Q dump. So yes, we wanted to gzip the output. We wanted to the quality definition line to just be a plus. Uh, and then we gave it the SRA file. The one thing I would say about this is that this is slightly different because the RNA seq data that we downloaded previously was well, single end data, and this is a paired end library. So um, we want to make sure that we split our reads from our SRA file out into uh, paired end reads. So um, we're going to run this and add an extra option to split our reads into their paired end, into their proper paired end um, uh, orientation. So. It's fast Q dump, dump. Uh, so then it's uh, dash dash gzip, dash dash uh, def line qual with just a plus in quotes. And then the option for splitting the reads out is dash dash split E. I don't know why it's split E, it's a bit odd, uh, but that's the option. Uh, and then we want to point it at our SRA file. So that is in the SRR11866736 directory. There is a file called uh, SRR11866736.sra. That's our SRA file. So this now will take that SRA file and convert it into two FASTQ files because it's a paired end file. So um, there you go, there's our FastQ, first and second FastQ files that are currently being produced by FastQ dump. Um, the only other thing that we need is a reference genome. Um, so um, let's uh, just have a quick look at the, um, at the K12 genome. So um, E. coli K12, which is the sort of and I'm sure I know there's some bacteriologists who are watching live and I'm sure they'll correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but this is um, uh, one of the sort of standard reference strains of E. coli uh, K12. So uh, the K12 genome is the one that we will download to align against. Um, so um, we can download this sequence in FASTA format. There's a link to it. This is a direct link to it here. So um, you can see, hopefully you can see the it popping up at the bottom of my screen there when I hover over that link. It's, it's an awfully complicated um, uh, URL. So I'm going to navigate to this, uh, this web page in my browser on my VM so that I can copy and paste that URL. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hide this from my screen. And then on my um, on my 
uh, virtual machine, I'm going to open my browser. So that is my web browser here at the top, which is um, usually Chromium, I think, or maybe Firefox. Doesn't really matter. So here's my browser, uh, which is going to open with some old websites that we've used in the past. Um, so let's go, it's ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. So the NCBI's website slash genome uh, for the genomes bit of that website. And then if we search the genome database for uh, coli K12, that should be sufficient to get me the genome that I just showed you on my hosts browser uh, or not that's interesting okay sure is sure there we go that's what I want to search for so I had to be slightly more fulsome so we want the download sequences in fast a format for genome so that's what we want we want the genome fast a so I'm going to right click on that and copy link location and then back in my terminal I'm going to do wget and then paste in that complicated URL okay so that is my genome data that I want to download um, from the NCBI so that's my k12 genome so off that goes to download so that's got me my reference genome and I've got some uh, reads to align against that reference genome. And now we need to talk about read, read alignment. So that's taken me half an hour, which is slightly longer than I expected. Um, and now we need to talk about read alignment and the principles behind read alignment. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about for the next half an hour or so is... Um, is a little bit of computer science. So it's an algorithm called the Burroughs-Wheeler transformation. Um, so let me just get my um, uh, my uh, whiteboard up, um, and then we can talk about this. So here we go. Up. Oh. We're going to talk about the Burroughs Wheeler transform. So, this is uh, an algorithm uh, which is very well known in computer science and is exploited in data compression. So, it's an algorithm that's used by um, particular data compression algorithms, particularly uh, the BGZIP2 algorithm, which we're not, which we don't generally make use of, although it is part of. Um, uh, the the BAM specification. So when we store SAM files as BAM files, which we'll come to later, uh, then it's the kind of compression that's used there. But we're not using it as a data compression algorithm here. We're using it as a transformation for a genome sequence to make it more searchable. Uh, and I what I will try and do is illustrate uh, a couple of things. So one, how this transform works. And I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail about um the myriad of ways in which it's used if you want um really detailed explanations of the algorithm and how exactly how the algorithm works that you can find those on uh on youtube already and you can find them from genomics people who are talking about it in a in a genomics point of view so um if you really really want to know the nuts and bolts of the burroughs wheeler transform um in genomics, then look for Ben Langmead's uh, lectures on on um, on algorithms in gene in in genomics because uh, I actually I've watched them today to make sure that I get this right uh, and um, he uh, he gives really clear explanations of how this all works. Uh, but I'm going to give you a, a, a broad strokes overview of how the Burroughs Wheeler transform works uh, and is used in genomics to make uh, a genome sequence more searchable. And I'm going to do this, I'm going to illustrate this by, uh, by applying the Burroughs-Wheeler transform by hand to the banana genome. Uh, and not very many people know this, but the banana genome is actually really simple. I'm just going to write it out here on my whiteboard. 
This is the banana genome. There you go. That's the banana genome. It's not really, obviously, but it's my, my joke, at which no student ever has ever laughed. Not that I'm bitter, but that's fine. Um, OK, so we're going to we're going to apply the Burroughs Wheeler transform to the banana genome. Um, so we've got a few processes to go through and I'm going to step through these um, uh, with you on my on my whiteboard here. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to put a a character at the end of our uh, our string, which is a, a non-alphabetic character. The reason for this is we're going to do some sorting later, and when we sort, we want a character that always sorts to the top. So the dollar sign here, which is usually used, um, always sorts to the top of a lexicographical sort. Uh, so it sorts before any of our alphabetical characters. So it's going to break ties. It's going to break alphabetic ties in um, uh, in in predictable ways because it will always sort to the top, and that's important. Okay, so we've got some processes to do. The first one of uh, the first process is to rearrange this string in lots of different ways, and it's to find. All we want, to, what we want to find, is all of the rotations of our genome in this case, or the thing that we want to transform. So we've got this string uh, banana with a dollar sign at the end, and we want to find all of the rotations of that. And to do that, we just we take the character uh, that's at the front of the string. Okay, so in this case the B, and we move it to the end. So over to the end here, and we shift everything else along a place to the left. And we do that until we've got all of the rotations of our initial starting string. So I'm going to write these out. So we start with banana with a dollar sign on the end. So then we shift the B to the end, and we shift everything along one pace to the left. So that gives us A, N, A, N, A, dollars and then the B is at the end, because we've shifted the B along to the end. And then we do that again. We take this time the A off the front, we shuttle it along to the end, and we shuffle everything else up one place. So N, A, N, A, dollars, B, A, is that next rotation. And then we keep going until we've got all of our rotations. So the N goes along to the end next. So we go A, N, A, dollars, B, A, N. And then another one. N, A, dollars, B, A, N, A. Then A, dollars, B, A, N, A, N. And then finally, this last one is dollars banana. Okay, so that is all of the rotations of and obviously one of them has failed to come up on my uh, whiteboard. Love how that well this syncs. Total adv adv advert for Microsoft this um, this uh, course sometimes. Right, let's delete that then. And try one more time. Otherwise, you're going to have to use your imagination for the one that's missing. Um, oh, here it comes this time. N A dollars B A N A. Okay, so that is all of the rotations of our original string. Uh, so then the next step is to take those uh, what we've got now, which is seven different strings, um, and we want to sort them lexicographically, so sort them in alphabetical order. And this is where this dollar sign comes in, really does come into play. Uh, so the dollar sign always sorts to the top. So the first one, the first of these alphabetically, is the one that starts with the dollar sign. So, so that's dollars banana. Okay, so that's that one. Let's cross through it. Um, and then the next one is the one which starts with an A. Uh, so the next set, alphabetically, are all of the strings which start with A's. And the first of those 
is the one where you get you get to a dollar sign first basically because they they all end uh, they all start either a n or a n a or a n a dollar or whatever so um the we've got this one this one and this one which all start with a's and uh this one this one here uh if that is going to pop up which it might not there you go that one there um is the one which where you reach the dollar sign first so that's the next one alphabetically okay so a dollar uh b a uh, n a n right, so that's that one uh, and then the next one is the is the one where you then reach the dollar sign next after that so that's that one which is a n a dollar b a n and then it's this one so a n a n a dollar b i'm sure the transcript of this video is going to be really really boring to listen to right uh, uh, to read sorry right so then uh, after a comes b alphabetically so that's that one so we've used that one we've used that one so the next one is uh b the first one banana with the dollar at the end that's that one and then we've got the ones which start with n so we've got these two left now uh this is the first one where you get to the dollar sign first so that's next alphabetically um so that is uh, n a dollar b a n a that's that one and then finally it's n a n a dollar b a so the question you may well be asking yourselves is what have we achieved by doing that? What exactly have we achieved? Um, and the answer is in how we then use this data. So um, we have uh, we've done a whole bunch of transformations to get us to this point. The 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 representation which is actually the Burroughs Wheeler transformed representation of our original string. So this is our original string over here, yeah, bananas. Um, the Burroughs Wheeler transformed version of that is the version that you find in the last column here of our what's called our Burroughs Wheeler matrix. Okay, so um, this here is a Burroughs Wheeler matrix. Okay, and this that final column is the Burroughs Wheeler transformed version of our original string. Okay, so that is um, the uh, that's our kind of BWT version of our string, um, and the question is, how do we then use this data structure? Um, meaningfully in 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 genomics, uh, so I'm just going to mention a couple of specific things about this. The first thing about this uh, that's important is that um, in this rearrangement in this column here, what you find is that um, characters of the same type tend to be brought together in groups. They're not. It's not completely sorted because that's not the way that this transformation works. But there are groups of the same character that are brought together. And that is what makes this a useful transformation in, um, in data compression, because the, the tendency of these characters to be brought together. Um, the other thing to note is that all of the positions of this matrix are linked, because these, this, is, uh, this matrix is produced by this rotational um, system that we generated. So this rotational system that we generated in this middle bit here, um, because of that, the, the linkage that we've got, the first column and the last column are linked to one another. So the, um, sorry, let me highlight those in red like that. The, um, so the characters in the, last column are the characters which immediately precede the characters in the first column 
in our original string. And the first column is in alphabetical order because we've done that sort. So um, we can work our way through that first column very easily because we know that we've got one dollar sign and then we've got a group of three of the same character. So we've got three A's and then one B and then two N's. And because that, because this uh, whole structure was produced by this rotational arrangement, the A's in the first column are in the same order as the A's in the second column. So this A here, which is the first A that we come across in the first column, that is the same A as this A here, which is the first A that we come across in the, in the, in the last column. So those A's are in the same order, and this A here is the same A as the second A that we come across in the second in the last column, which is this A here. So those two A's are the same. And then the third A here, that's the same as this A. And that is a property of this matrix, of this, bar of this transformation, that the order of the characters in the first column is the same as the order of those same characters in the last column. Um, and the way that we're then going to use this, this data for searching exploits that feature of this matrix. So I'm now just going to talk about the process of searching um, this Burroughs Wheeler transform data uh, just to show you this. So let me uh, delete all of this. Do, 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 do. So this is should all disappear, I hope. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have to refresh. I don't particularly want to have to refresh. Um, I'm rubbing all of that out so that we can start writing again. And obviously, it's not going to disappear because why would it? OK, so let me just um, sort that out and get this refreshed so that we're back to a nice blank screen. Meanwhile, I'll start doing the actual writing that I need to do so that um, I'm not completely stuck. OK, here we go. Right. Um, why is only half of it erased? Oh, no, there we go. That's back. Right, OK, so... Um, Sorry, I'll take that back off so that you can see what I'm doing. Right, here we go. So what we actually need to do the searching here is from that from that Burroughs-Wheeler matrix that we produced, we need the first column, which has got our characters in alphabetical order. That's our first column, which is A, 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 B, N, N. And we need our last column, which... Um, we had before, but it's A, N, N, uh, B, dollars, uh, A, A. And it would have been really nice if I got those to line up. It's not too bad. Uh, we know from before that the A's in the first column, let's call them 0, 1, and 2, are in the same order as the A's in the second column, 0, 1, and 2. Okay. And that's true of the Bs. It's also true of this dollar sign, sorry, by the way, as well. Uh, and it's true of these Ns here. So there you go. That is uh, our sort of annotated data structure. Um, this is essentially what is stored when you do your burroughs wheeler transform. So um, uh, you store the last column uh, like that. So you store the, the order of the characters in the last column and you just store the number of everything in this column. Because it's in alphabetical order, you only need to know that there are three A's, one B and two N's. You don't need to know uh, what order they're in because they're in alphabetical order. OK, so um, that's the data structure that we want to store. And now the question is, how do we search that data structure? So we're going to search it for uh, occurrences of... Uh, a, N, A. Okay, so let's search for 
uh, well, now that we've indexed our genome, so this is our this is what we would refer to. This here is what we would refer to as our genome index, essentially. Uh, now that we've indexed our genome, how do we then search that index um, for uh, for occurrences of strings that we're interested in? So we're interested in A N A, and the way that you do this is um, by uh, matching the matching the character at the end, and then walking left. Okay, so you start by matching the A at the end. And then you walk to the left, so you go, you proceed from the A back towards the beginning. Um, so um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to match the A's, and we're going to, and we're going to walk left. So the first question that you ask then is, where are the A's in our sequence? And um, because our First, our first column is sorted alphabetically, we can grab them as a block. So we know that we have three A's and that's where they belong. That's where they come from in that first column. So we can just grab those three A's. But what we're interested in is we're interested in A's which are preceded by N's. Okay, So we want an A which has an N in front of it. And because of the linkage between the first column and the last column, where the characters in the last column here are the characters which precede the characters in the first column. So if you look across a row and you see an A in the first column and an N in the last column, you know that this A here, so A0, is preceded by an N because that N is in the last column. So you want the A's from the left hand side, but you want the A's that are preceded by N's. So the A's where there is an N on the right hand side in the last column. So that is A0 and A1. Okay, They are A's which are preceded by N's. And the ends which they are preceded by are actually the only two ends in the sequence, but are n0 and n1. Okay, so they are the ends which are uh, which precede those a's in in uh, in our original sequence. And these will be brought together in a block because of the alphabetical sorting. So you will always pull out a block of this index like this. Um, so then the next question is then, okay, well, we've, we've identified A's preceded by N's, and what we now want is for those N's to be preceded by A's. So we know the block of N's that we want. It's N0 and N1, okay? So we're going to go and pull out that block of N's from the left-hand side. So we're going to go back over, step back over to the left-hand side, and now we want those N's. So this block of N's from that block of ends, we want the ends which are preceded by a's. So again, we look from the left over to the right and say, are, are either of these ends preceded by a's? And in this case, the answer is that both of those ends are preceded by a's. Okay, so they are both a1 and a2 are both a's that precede ends. So you could carry this match on if if this if this thing that you were searching for here was longer, and particularly if your genome was longer, bear in mind, um, you could say, well, okay, so I've got, now I've got these, my candidates now are um, A1 and A2. And maybe you wanted, actually wanted to find instances of NANA. And so you would say, well, okay, I've got A1 and A2, that's my block of A's, uh, which precede N's. And now I want to walk. Um, I want to walk left one more step, and so I want A's which are preceded by N's because I want N A N A. And there's one instance of that, and that's A one. So A one, uh, so N one, sorry, then becomes the start point of your alignment, um, and um, so that's the N that precedes the A. Uh, in the previous column and so then you know that that's the start point of your alignment and you have one NANA -N -A match in your original string and you can figure out 
Uh, there are then tricks, which again, I'm not going to go into here. Ben Langmead talks about in his videos of then figuring out where in the string that match is. Um, so um, that's essentially how this data structure is A, constructed, and then B, B used for searching um, uh, for exact matches of particular strings. And so lots and lots of uh, aligners for high throughput sequence data exploit this transformation and this data structure for uh, for making a genome more searchable. And it's about the size of your genome. It's about the, the efficiency of searching it. Uh, these are all factors in... Um, in making sure that uh, uh, these are all factors in this, the, the choice of this algorithm for converting data in in um, in sequencing algorithms. So that's the Burroughs Wheeler transform, and hopefully I've done an okay job of of showing you how it works. As I said, there are there are people who are. Um, who have done a really good job of explaining this already and have done have had more time to do it. So I would encourage you to seek those videos out um, if uh, if you want to know more about how this this particular transformation works. But this transformation is used by um, lots and lots of software, many pieces of which you will have heard of. So the BW in BWA stands for Burroughs Wheeler. BWA is the Burroughs Wheeler aligner. Um, so the Burroughs Wheeler transform is used in the Burroughs Wheeler in, in indexing the genome for the Burroughs Wheeler aligner. Um, uh, the another aligner you may have heard of is called Bowtie, which you might notice has the characters B, W, and T in it. So Bowtie again uses the Burroughs Wheeler transform at the heart of its algorithm, uh, and subsequently Bowtie two as well. So. Um, for aligning the data that we have downloaded this afternoon, so we've downloaded uh, some FASTQ data and we've downloaded a reference genome, we're going to use Bowtie 2 for doing our alignments. Okay, So we're going to use uh, an algorithm which uses this Burroughs-Wheeler transform for doing our alignments. And that is what we're going to do tomorrow. So at this point, I'm going to leave this. Uh, and hopefully that wasn't too uh, bamboozling for everybody. Um, and... Um, um, we uh, so that's the Burroughs Wheeler transform. We've downloaded some data. Tomorrow we're going to use the Burroughs Wheeler transform um, to align our FASTQ reads to our um, to our uh, FASTA reference genome, which we downloaded. So we downloaded those two things at the beginning, and that's what we're going to do. Not tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, I've got to get used to not doing this every day. Uh, okay, so uh, no Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Sorry, I, yes, I'm. It's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So the next one will not be tomorrow. It will stay. Okay, so um, for those live streamers, yes, come back in two days' time, uh, not tomorrow. Um, so we're going to use Bowtie two to do make to do an alignment, uh, and it's a two stage process, and we'll talk about that. Uh, on Wednesday. Okay, so thanks to everybody for tuning in. It's good to see um, so many familiar names in the chat, and thanks for coming back. And uh, we will pick this up on Wednesday. So uh, keep safe and stay well. Have a good couple of days, and I'll see you all in the next session in number 44.